My name is Dee Dee Gardner, and I will be our host today. This webinar is sponsored by CHEST and Santa Fe Pasteur. The webinar will be for you practitioners in primary care, specialty care, and acute care. Um, our presenters today, uh, Dr. Stephanie Briney and uh, Corinne Young, will be speaking to us, um, looking at the role of providers in increasing vaccination rates to reduce complications of influenza. They'll also provide an update on ACIP and the CDC recommendations and discuss the importance of the influenza vaccine during COVID-19 pandemic. We look forward to, to sharing this information with all of you today. I would like to take a moment to introduce our first presenter. Our first presenter is Dr. Stephanie Briney. She is a family physician who practices at a federally qualified health center in Phoenix, Arizona, and serves as the Director of Service Learning at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. Her clinical and academic work focus on care of the underserved patient populations, as well as addressing social determinants of health and health equity through medical education, community collaboration, and community service. We'll go ahead and move the slide forward so that Dr. Briney can begin. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Dee Dee, for the introduction. Um, Dee Dee mentioned this um, webinar is directed towards um, providers, but also administrators um, anybody really providing care for patients during this time, because even though we all are aware of the benefits of the flu vaccine, we're really hoping that we can help motivate and prepare um, providers and administrators to improve vaccination rates within our own um, patient, patient panels. And so I'm going to give an overview of the indications um, and recommendations for the influenza vaccines. And Carla, if you could please advance the slide. So who should get the flu vaccine? Pretty much everybody. So anybody over the age of six months, um, there are very few contraindications to the flu vaccine. It should be an annual flu vaccine. Ideally, this will take place during September or October, but really we should continue to vaccinate our patients all the way until seasonal, um, or sorry, local um, influenza cases have um, declined significantly. So for us, like I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and we are still vaccinating people as late as March and um, we even cases up through April. Um, but right now is really the ideal time. Contraindications, like I mentioned, are relatively few. So anybody under the age of six months, People who have severe life-threatening allergies to the flu vaccine, not necessarily eggs, but the flu vaccine itself or ingredients in the vaccine. Um, and then people who have a history of Guillain-Barre syndrome may have a contraindication. Really, it depends on the, the type of vaccine that led to Guillain-Barre in the past and the timing of that vaccine. It should be uh, looked at on an individual basis. And you'll also want to take into consideration the patient's individual risk of severe flu-related illness. Egg allergy itself is not a contraindication. And actually the ACIP um, guidelines are updated this year to include though that people who have a history of severe reaction to eggs um, should have, and, and if they're receiving a flu vaccine that is not the cell-based um, flu cell vax or the flu block um, recombinant vaccine, so any of the egg-based with a severe egg allergy history should have that vaccine administered in an appropriate setting. So somewhere where a provider is familiar with uh, able to recognize the symptoms of a severe allergy and also able to treat those. But just uh, as a FYI, the actual rates of anaphylaxis from any flu vaccine are really low, like 1.3 per 1 million based on the CDC study. So not really a major concern, but just something to be aware of. Uh, next slide, please. So not only should we be providing vaccines for pretty much all of our patients, we should also really look at increased vaccination efforts towards high risk populations. So targeted efforts for high risk groups, the risk factors are on the right side of the slide, um, any healthcare personnel, and in this year in particular, essential workers, and people who live with or who care for high risk individuals. The risk factors include extremes of age, so that age from like six months to five years of age is a high risk. Um, and also those who are older than 50 years. I take care of patients from birth through death. And actually for our young infants, we're always trying to get their parents or siblings vaccinated as well. So again, that's somebody who's living with that high risk individual, even if they're too young to receive the vaccine themselves. 
Persons who have chronic illness or immunocompromised states, residents um, in long-term care facilities, persons with extreme obesity, um, women who are pregnant, children who are on chronic aspirin therapy because of the risk of rise syndrome, and then um, patients who come from Ameri Ameri sorry, American Indian or Alaska Native descent have increased risk of flu-related complications, so increased risk of death and hospitalization, and really we should be targeting this population as well. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the chronic conditions to consider are obviously chronic pulmonary conditions. Um, certainly people who have asthma, chronic lung disease, and are smokers are gonna have increased risk of pulmonary complications. Very self-explanatory. Um, one that I don't always consider actually is cardiovascular conditions. So people who have um, CAD or coronary artery disease equivalents, um, heart failure at increased risk. Um, actually one of the leading causes of flu-related death is um, acute MI, um, so really important. And we'll talk about that a little bit um, in one of the following slides. Chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, persons with hematologic disorders and metabolic disorders, and then finally neurologic and neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a lot of literature, and I'm just gonna focus right now on the cardiovascular benefits. Um, one thing to point out is that you're not gonna see a lot of risk controlled or placebo controlled trials because the proof of benefit is striking that this is the standard of care. Really everybody should be getting And so having a placebo controlled trial um, kind of pushes the, you know, or potentially creates an ethical dilemma by holding the standard of care from the placebo group. So there's a meta-analysis of case-controlled studies showing a vaccine effectiveness of about 29% for prevention of acute MI. So this is on par with what we've seen in previous observational studies looking at other preventive measures like um, smoking cessation, statin use, and antihypertensive therapy. So these others are really, you know, mainstay of our um, preventive care for patients with coronary artery um, disease and risk equivalents but really the flu vaccine should be part of that as well. Again, there's um, another associated vaccine in cardiovascular, other high risk patients, so people who have um, more significant coronary artery disease. Um, there's a meta-analysis, this one did actually include some RCTs that showed again, that there's a lower risk of adverse cardiovascular events in the persons who are in, um, immunized against influenza and more significantly so in those who have more active coronary artery disease. For persons who have heart failure, there's this nationwide cohort study that took place in Denmark. It included 134,000 patients over more than 10 years. And after adjusting for other confounding variables, um, like some of the socioeconomic factors, um, they were able to show that the annual vaccination uh, or the annual flu vaccine was associated with an 18% reduced risk of death. And more significantly so, um, annual vaccination, vaccination earlier in the year, increased number of vaccinations uh, showed an increased or a, a greater reduction in death compared to just intermittent vaccination. So again, just realizing the importance of every year getting our patients vaccinated. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to advance the slide. Could you do that for me, please, Carla? Thank you. This year at the American Heart Association, they had a, a presentation at a virtual conference in July, 2020. It was titled Magnitude and Impact of Underutilization of Flu Vaccine in High-Risk U.S. Cohorts. It's an interesting study. It's a very large retrospective cohort study that used the 2014 National Inpatient Sample Database and looked at flu vaccine use and outcomes in hospitalized high-risk groups. And in this study, they were able to show that adults age 50 or older and high risk groups were less likely to be vaccinated during their hospitalization. So this is contrary to what we expect. My optimistic side likes to think that perhaps these patients had already received the vaccine before they were hospitalized, though I expect that that's the only because even so, they were able to show that in these high-risk groups, those who had received the vaccine during the hospitalization, they had a reduced risk of MI, cardiac arrest, TIA, and mortality. And so, um, again, just more evidence, I guess, to, to show that flu vaccination really does help reduce those coronary um, and cardiovascular-related deaths. Next slide, please. 
So why vaccinate? Well, I think it's kind of clear, um, but in case it wasn't already enough, um, during just the last year's flu season, the CDC estimated that the flu caused 38 million flu illnesses, 400,000 flu hospitalizations, and 22,000 flu deaths. So last year, we had our highest uh, annual vaccination rate um, in reported, I guess, recent history. So 52% of the eligible U.S. population received the flu vaccine, um, which is great, but definitely shows that we're you know, missing about half of our population. But based on those 52% receiving the flu vaccine, the estimates show that perhaps uh, we had prevented 105,000 hospitalizations and 6,300 deaths. So that's 17 lives per day that were saved by annual flu vaccination, according to CDC. And next slide, please. So this is only 50% of our population who's being vaccinated, despite the fact that the CDC, ACIP, American Heart Association, really like all of the major professional societies, American College of OBGYN, American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, everybody's recommending the flu vaccine. We have staggering numbers of studies that show benefits and reduce hospitalization rates, reduce death rates. Um, it's a standard of care, proven benefit, very minimal risks, um, yet only 50%. So, and then the other thing just to add is that this year in particular with COVID, um, the CDC is re-emphasizing that administration of vaccines is an essential medical service. So it's important for us to keep in mind, especially if we're working from like a remote um, setting. So really our goal as providers and administrators is to help reach these patients to complete this important preventive intervention. So increasing their access to vaccines and providing education to reduce vaccine resistance. Next slide. So yes, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and so maybe people are not necessarily prioritizing the flu right now, but it's actually extra important because of this, because even more than before, our healthcare systems are really being stressed. Um, this is, you know, we have higher uh, numbers than usual of hospitalized patients, um, seriously ill patients, patients in the ICU or um, receiving respiratory support. And so adding on an additional burden through the flu um, during this season could potentially be really harmful for our healthcare system, but also our patients. And not only that, but now because of COVID-19, we're seeing these gaps in health equity that we were aware of, but maybe not quite as acutely so. We're really seeing them show up more and more. So ethnic minorities who are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19 are the same populations that are also less likely to be vaccinated against the flu. The flu vaccine does not increase the risk of being affected by COVID-19. There are studies that show no increased rates of infection with COVID-19 and no increased harms um, in those who receive the flu vaccine. And even though we haven't been able to show the prognosis really for patients with a co-infection, one could imagine that it's potentially worse. Next slide. So the other thing about COVID-19 is it's really affecting our ability to reach patients or how we're reaching patients has changed. So we've been able to see already that routine preventive visits have decreased significantly. Childhood vaccinations across the board have decreased. Um, in previous years, people perhaps were receiving their flu vaccine from a work-based um, uh, process. Um, and I'm sorry, an employer sponsored program, but that's gonna play less of a role this year with a lot of people working from home. There are um, fewer opportunities for us to provide vaccine in person because we have fewer patients being seen in person. So telemedicine visits have gone up significantly. Looking at this spring compared to last spring, primary care in-office visits decreased by 50%. Um, there are more consumers who report they feel unsafe going to their doctor's office or to the hospital. And of the older adults in one study that were um, that had access to telemedicine, more than 80% of them still had had a virtual visit. So um, really these are the patients we need to connect to somehow in order to make sure that we're providing their them the flu vaccine as well as other standards of care. And then one thing just to mention is that COVID-19, um, anybody who has a known case or a suspected case of COVID-19, can receive the flu vaccine, it's safe. And if they're already in your office, that's an opportunity to vaccinate them. However, um, it might not be a good time to bring them in. Um, specifically, you may wanna wait until after they've kind of you know, met the uh, requirements for termination of isolation, just to reduce the risk of transmission to other patients or healthcare employees. 
Next slide, please. Okay, and then just a, a quick update for the ACIP for this um, flu season, 2020, 2021. There have been some updates to the flu vaccine itself, to the components of the flu vaccine. There are two new flu vaccines that have been licensed. Both of these um, are updates to vaccines that were used in previous years. So flu zone and flu ad, um, they are high dose and now quadrivalent vaccines that are recommended only for those who are 65 and older. Next slide. And then in terms of contraindications, just for the live attenuated influenza vaccine, not for others, um, there have been some expanded criteria. So persons who have anatomic and functional asplenia, um, active communication between the CSF and oropharynx, nasopharynx or other um, cavities, as well as cochlear implants have been added to the contraindications, at least the discussion for the contraindications. Um, there's some updates to the influenza antiviral medication recommendations in the setting of the live attenuated influenza virus vaccine. And then um, the recommendation that we already discussed about, you know, persons with the history of egg allergy now receiving uh, um, egg based vaccine under the appropriate um, supervision. So my final slide here is just kind of some thought provoking questions for all of us, if you could advance it, please, Carla. Essentially, um, just to, you know, give us something to think about, how are we going to message the benefits of immunization and coordinate that with telemedicine? And Corinna is going to go over a lot of this. How can we use alternative vaccination sites or patient flows to increase access? How can we increase patient engagement? This is really important. How do we use social media or targeted um, messaging and outreach? And then just perhaps this might be a good year to use the discussion around a COVID vaccine to increase interest and hopefully uptake of the influenza vaccine as well. And that will be my last seat. I'm gonna, my last slide, I'm gonna hand it over to Corinne to talk about how we can really help our patients to get vaccinated. I would like to introduce Corinne Young. She has uh, been working in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine for the last 15 years. Most recently, she's been practicing in Colorado Springs in a group practice. She is also the president and founder of the Association of Pulmonary Advanced Practice Providers, a nonprofit organization for nurse practitioners and physician assistants working in the pulmonary critical care sleep medicine realm. Ms. Young participates in multiple networks at CHEST and sits on the Pulmonary Disease Board for the American Board of Internal Medicine. Welcome, Karen. We look Thank forward you. to your presentation. Thank you. So um, this slide title here, How to Get Your Patients Vaccinated for Flu in a COVID World, is because if getting them vaccinated before wasn't already difficult enough, now we add a pandemic and this social media storm of information and misinformation about viruses in general and vaccinations. Um, and so it just kind of makes our job a little bit harder. Harder. So today I'm going to try to discuss some of these barriers with you and hopefully some solutions to getting your patients vaccinated for this upcoming season. Next slide, please. So education, I think, is one of the biggest barriers with patients, them understanding the need for, for the vaccination as well as the risks of going unvaccinated. So I think Stephanie did a great job of reviewing who needs to be vaccinated and having your patients really understand why you're a separate cohort than their neighbor or than somebody else who doesn't have the same disease state that they do and what those complications of the flu vaccine are. It's not just that you're going to feel poorly and miss work, but your risk of dying, your risk of hospitalization, your risk of respiratory failure are this much higher higher. Um, also talking to them about timing of vaccination. So for the most part, you know, September through March or April, depending on um, where you live in the United States, is what is recommended for patients. But making sure they also know if they missed um, a piece of the early onset window, like I tell my patients, I like them to be vaccinated by Halloween. I think it's a date most patients can remember um, that it's not too late. You can vaccinate all the way into January, February, March. Um, if you're still seeing a lot of cases in your area, whatever protection you can give them um, is, is valid and, and needed for them. Um, and then lastly, talking to your patients about which type of flu vaccine, and Stephanie touched on this, and I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail because I do have a lot of patients who have questions about these different types of vaccines. So um, quadrivalent vaccines have come in and basically um, displaced the trivalent vaccines, which were popular a couple years ago. Trivalent vaccines had two influenza A 
H1N1 and H3N2, and usually one influenza B strain. And these quadrivalents have two A strains, two B strains. So general idea being more is better as far as providing coverage for patients to protect them from strains that may be prevalent that year. The high dose um, vaccine, also noted as um, adjuvated vaccines, um, some patients will call this the senior dose. You might hear them come into the office asking, should I get the senior dose, the high dose? What is this? What does it mean? So how I describe it is that this type of dose contains four times the amount of antigen that's in a standard vaccine dose. And so there have been a lot of studies discussing the benefit of high dose vaccines, that they can be more effective in preventing flu in adults 65 and older compared to a standard vaccine. Um, and there's also been some other reports about reducing um, hospital admissions related to uh, influenza infection in patients who got the high dose um, vaccine versus the standard care, especially those that are living in long term care facilities, they saw a lot of benefit in reducing hospitalization. So that's kind of where that high dose vaccination comes in for your patient 65 plus, especially those that are probably at the highest risk that you feel could tolerate that type of vaccine. The cell-based and recombinant vaccines are egg-free or ovobumin-free vaccines. So your patients who are really concerned about the egg-based allergen, although, you know, we can give them the reassurance that, you know, 1.3 in a million chance of, of, of patients are going to end up with um, an egg-based allergy and that we could supervise you and maybe um, provide some support if you're to have any reaction. If they're still very um, concerned about these are two options that you have that are egg-free. The cell-based vaccines, there have been some arguments that they may actually provide a little better protection than the egg-based flu vaccine varieties. Um, and basically, they can be similar to what they're calling the wild strains of flu viruses. They're, they're a little more similar than the egg-based vaccines. Um, there have been also some studies showing that they, they may also provide a better um, protection against the flu-related hospitalizations than those of standard egg-based vaccines. So there may be a little edge in these uh, types of vaccines for patients also. Um, they're not new to the industry. Uh, we use cell-based uh, vaccinations for rotavirus, polio, smallpox, hepatitis, rubella, varicella vaccines. They're all cell-based varieties, so it's not some um, new technology that patients might be a little concerned about. It's something we have been using for a while. Um, how it actually works is the CDC or one of its laboratory partners use the influenza virus um, that's been grown in cells to make candidate vaccine viruses that then um, are provided to a manufacturer that inoculates a candidate vaccine virus into a cultured mammalian cell of some sort um, instead of eggs, which this is usually when it would be uh, put into an egg. Um, and it allows this candidate vaccine to replicate for a few days. And then they take this um, and this, this virus um, antigen and they purify it. And this process goes on, is tested, and then finally approved by the FDA to be shipped out. Um, this is the difference between cell-based and recombinant. So recombinant um, vaccines, again, also egg-free, do not require a candidate vaccine virus. Instead, they obtain the DNA of the virus for the purpose of making a surface protein called hematagglutinin, which is is um, what causes the antigen um, response um, for our immune system. And so um, this hematagglutinin antigen is combined with um, Beclovirus, which is a common um, virus that affects uh, invertebrates. Um, and so then it becomes a recombinant vaccine. Um, so again, there, there may be a little information and, and we may see a little more of this going on talking about non a based vaccines, especially we're talking with COVID vaccines and how they're producing them now. Um, that may be, um, you know, uh, may come out and patients may hear more things about this. So it's so that you have more information to share with them about the differences. Um, the other nice thing about the egg-free options is that um, it's not dependent on egg supply. So if we have a problem with egg supply or we find ourselves in a condition where we are now in a pandemic where mass volumes of vaccination of vaccines are going to need to be produced, you know, we're not going to be uh, dependent on an on a egg um, uh, process. The last one, the nasal sprays, um, it's definitely different, definitely covered. Um, it seems as though the list of who it is not indicated might be a little larger than who it is indicated. So again, approved for patients four to 49 years old, but some of the concerns and precautions are that again, not for pregnant women, children um, two through 17 who are receiving aspirin therapy or salicylic acid containing medications, um, those who are immune suppressed and including people who are caring for those who are immune suppressed. If they're caring for someone who's immune 
immune suppressed because it's a live attenuated virus. They have to avoid contact with those persons for about seven days um, after they receive the nasal spray. Again, if they're asplenic or have a dysfunctioning spleen um, and then that active leak of CSF um, cochlear implants like she discussed. And then um, if they've had any exposure to antiviral medications, um, especially oseltamivir and zanamivir within 48 hours of their vaccine, um, preamivir in the previous five days before the vaccine or baloxmivir in the past 17 days before vaccine. So all of these can affect that immune response that they're going to need for that uh, nasal spray live attenuated vaccine to kind of um, take effect like it's supposed to. So um, there's also some discussion about um, uh, children five years old and older with uh, severe asthma that those patients potentially could have a problem post-vaccination, so they may need to be watched. Again, you know, some of these um, vaccines are given in a pharmacy or, or, or grocery store setting, and so, you know, you worry a little bit about the education they might receive pre-getting these uh, vaccines. So hopefully this gives you a little more information to share with your patients before they go out and get vaccinated. Next slide, please. So another big barrier is fear, right? You know, we have patients um, out there getting all sorts of information that may not be true. So understanding um, what's out there so that you can debunk it, um, having that information, because um, I, I try to avoid a lot of that stuff online, but I almost feel like the more I know what patients are seeing, it might help me have that discussion with them. Um, understanding the safety, um, knowing what their true risks of a side effect are and what those are going to look like for them. And then also talking to them about this new fear that they have about leaving their home to get vaccinated and where is it safe for them to go and how to get that and how safe is it for them to go to a facility to get vaccinated. Logistics and safety, um, I think, is a new one on the healthcare side of how to vaccinate these patients because we need to understand what our community um, access is for these patients, right? Are we going to start treating uh, flu vaccines like toilet paper? And now we're going to run out, you know, soon because patients are going to be a little more aggressive about getting vaccinated this year. You know, we kind of have to wait and see how much access does your facility have? How many vaccines do you have? How are you going to distribute those among your patients? Um, also dealing with the possible influx of patients in your office, how are you still going to be able to provide good social distancing and, and COVID-19 risk reduction recommendations um, by accommodating all these patients into your office for a vaccine? Um, there's considerations for a walkthrough or drive-through clinic, which I'm going to discuss in a couple of slides. And then now we really have to worry about protecting yourself and your staff because not only are they coming in for a vaccine, but they may also be a carrier of COVID or, you know, have some early COVID symptoms um, that now you're increasing again the volume of exposure of your of your staff too so next slide so telemedicine, like um, Stephanie had touched on, I think is is here to help. Um, it's definitely safe, right? You can have this face-to-face -face visit with your patients without exposing them or yourselves to anything. It's educational. You can have this one-on-one -on -one discussion with your patient that is maybe just a flu visit. You know, we're seeing these volumes are down, and so we may have some time to actually do a little more education with our patients and schedule flu visits if they if you don't have documentation that your patient's been vaccinated yet. And this is a great opportunity for your nurse educators, respiratory therapists, NPs, PAs, or your providers, your phys physician providers to get involved in, in providing this level of education for your patients. And there are a lot of educational billable CPT codes out there, and I don't know how they're really going to play in with telemedicine, but definitely an, are an opportunity for your staff. It's very efficient. Um, a lot of telephone platforms, like the ones that we use, I can push documents right to the patient during the telemedicine visit. It pops up on their screen. So you might be able to save some time by providing their vaccine information sheet, the VIS um, form ahead of time, maybe the consent form for them to bring in signed, um, you know, maybe links or documents about the flu if they have some, some, some concerns. So you might be able to give them all that pre-education before they even step foot in your office for the vaccine. And then, of course, the assurance. Um, it gives you time to explain to patients what you've done um, in your own practice to protect them and how you're going to keep them safe. Um, and maybe even information about what to expect when they arrive. My office is located within a hospital, and so the hospital screens them when they walk in the door. So just knowing that there's going to be multiple steps to getting screened and who can come with them and how many visitors or whoever they can have in the office with them. So again, it's a great way to prep them for what's coming when they come into your office. Next slide. 
So thinking outside the box about how to get your patients vaccinated, I think one of the more successful industries during COVID and the shutdown have been grocery stores. They did great during this time. And so I think we could definitely take a cue from them. So, you know, they had designated high risk patient um, or high risk um, shopping hours and time. So maybe this is something you consider for different cohorts of your practice that you contact with certain disease states to come in on certain days or times where they'll have less exposure to the general population of your patients, you know, kind of like special vaccine times for them. Um, Or again, just grouping them out by who definitely needs to be vaccinated first before your general population that may be under 65 or not have chronic health conditions. Um, Delivery service, you know, that's a great thing about grocery shopping, not having to go uh, in and shop, but, um, you know, home vaccination options may be an issue, may be an option. Um, Dispatch Health is one of the many companies um, that I know of is just an example that do in-home visits. Um, They have a provider that comes out, a physician or a NP that would do a full exam on the patient, but a lot of them are also providing in-home vaccination. So you're homebound or um, otherwise risky patients that you may not want to get out and about. You can get them into... um, you know, maybe a service to come out to them to vaccinate. Um, Buying in bulk, which grocery stores are always trying to get us to do, you know, not just focusing on vaccinating the patient, but making sure they know the importance of having all their family members they live with get vaccinated to reduce their risk. Maybe their best friend or someone who they spend a lot of time with outside of their immediate family, making sure they're vaccinated. So talking to them about, you know, yes, getting you vaccinated is important, but the further we can spread that out continues to protect you. Um, And lastly, the online options, right? So um, online, uh, people are spending a lot more time online because they're staying home a lot more. So this is a great opportunity for you to update your portal and social media pages, websites to talk about the flu. We're we're doing vaccines now. These are the vaccines that we have. Here's information on them. Um, uh, Some portals will allow patients to even book appointment times to come in for vaccination. So just kind of really expanding on all the access that you can provide for patients um, and education. Next slide. So walkthrough clinics I mentioned before is just like it sounds. They walk through. It's a one-way walkthrough flu clinic. So they come in through one door. They go through several stations. They exit through a different door. So they don't have um, exposure to the same staff or other patients or things like that. So it generally has multiple stations, you know, one where they make sure they have the appointment. The patients understand that it's one way only. Make sure they're queuing appropriately away from each other. Station two would then verify their information, make sure they have the signed consent, um, give them their information sheets. Um, The third station would then immunize them. And then there's an option for a holding station if they're going to be driving or they're there alone, just to kind of keep an eye on them. And then getting them to the exit, which is going to be separate from the original entrance. Next slide. Sanofi Pasture had provided us with these forms, which talk about planning, preparing, and performing for a walkthrough clinic and what you would need um, to do this within your facility. And then there's also the actual logistical flow, how it would flow through the office. And so again, this may be limited by how large your practice is and what access in and out of your building is and those types of things. But in some facilities, this this might be a great option for patients that um, maybe is during a different time of the day or after hours or patients just flow right through. They're not exposed to anybody else really helps limit their exposures. Next slide. So the drive-through option um, is great for patients who are just not comfortable leaving uh, or coming into your office. Maybe they'll leave the house, but they're not willing to come up um, actually to your office. So um, it is um, giving these patients the comfort and safety of just staying in their vehicle, kind of like, and I I think patients are going to be familiar with this, like with the drive-up COVID um, testing, right? It's kind of very similar. Um, It makes sure that they're separated from sick and healthy patients. It's just whoever they're in the vehicle with. And um, also helps reduce traffic actually through your office. So you're not exposing your staff maybe to um, a lot more uh, patients. Just like the walkthrough clinic, um, multiple stations kind of moving in one direction um, and getting them through. Um, Some concerns about drive-through clinics is, you know, obviously you have to have a, a location that can accommodate this drive-through process, right, with multiple stations. Um, and obviously traffic coming in or going out are going to affect the flow and, and kind of back things up. Um, weather, you, right now it's snowing in Colorado, so that would be a real bummer for your staff to be outside um, during some bad weather to do it in. 
And then, of course, the safety for your staff, because now we have moving vehicles and elderly patients, and, you know, that can be a little bit of a concern there. But hopefully these have given you some ideas of um, ways that maybe you can expand your access for your patients to get vaccinated either with yourself or other facilities. Um, and that's all that I have for you guys for today. Great. Thank you very much for the information. Um, I see that uh, Dr. Briney has already started answering a question that has come forward, but um, one of our guests is asking a question about the fact that they are a healthcare provider over the age of 60 and the area where this person lives, the flu is more commonly seen in the spring. Um, and the question is, is, you know, should I receive a second vaccine in January to limit the waxing and waning of the protection um, known to occur with the time range? So um, I will turn that over to the two of you. Um, but again, I guess, Stephanie, you started answering. And so we'll start with you and then Corinne, if you want to um, jump in to follow. Okay. I'll say that it's a really good question um, and something that you may have seen actually, because there's been a little bit in the literature and I can't remember actually if it's, you know, a little bit like in some of the scientific literature, but also a lot in kind of like more common, um, like New York Times type stuff. Um, just looking at, you know, do people need a second flu vaccine, especially if they received their flu vaccine early this year, because a lot of the recommendations were that we perhaps wait until September or October because the earlier vaccination rates um, don't provide maybe full coverage through the entire flu season. And so even though we're seeing some of that anecdotally and based on some of the evidence, there's actually no recommendation yet that people receive a second flu vaccine. So um, children nine and younger who haven't received the annual flu vaccine ever can get two flu vaccines in a season, a month apart. Um, but everybody else should just get one seasonal flu vaccine. Corinne, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I get that question a lot from patients also, and I tell them the exact same thing. There's not any real data to support a full recommendation to do that. Um, if they're very concerned about, um, you know, um, developing disease later, um, you know, I do say, well, maybe, you know, you wait until that later in October or early in November timeframe. I just really worry about all the social gathering that tends to happen after October. We have Thanksgiving, we have other holidays that start and they start, you know, shopping more, being exposed with family. And so I, I continue to try to get them vaccinated before definitely any of those holiday timeframes. I can see that. The other question, and again, it looks like uh, Dr. Briney, you've already started answering, but I'll go ahead and ask anyway, um, what is the physiological explanation for the reduction of risk of myocardial infarction for receiving annual flu vaccination? All right, there's a helicopter going overhead. <laughs> and I'm outside because of my internet connection. Um, but, um, so there, there was a good article in uh, JAMA that looked a lot at a lot of it, um, and lots of these looking at um, you know the potential causes. And so one thing that we know for sure is that all infectious diseases, or you know perhaps most infectious diseases, can cause like a kind of pro-inflammatory state in the body. So whether that's inflammation in arteries, the lining of the arteries, and the um, atherosclerotic plaques. Just that increased inflammation certainly puts people at an increased risk. And um, my feeling is that that might be one of the main reasons, but all that prothrombotic state that occurs as a response to inflammatory changes from infections usually. So flu vaccine um, not being the only one, but those are probably the two major, two major causes. There are also some studies that have just shown that there are EKG changes that have people who have influenza, they've been able to isolate influenza RNA from um, atherosclerotic plaques um, in postmortem cases. And um, those are probably the, the main reasons. Um, I think we don't really have know really the full effect, but that's it. So I guess the clarification here on the question about getting a second vaccine is um, whether a healthcare provider who's at risk should get it. Do you so, see any difference? I don't yeah, know again, the, yeah, again, there's no recommendation currently, you know, so it's really hard to say, you know, no, 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 um, 
medical or scientific body at this point is saying that it's recommended. I don't think there's enough data out there on healthcare providers, although now with COVID and and tracing and watching um, healthcare provider um, morbidity and mortality related to this virus, we might find out a little bit more um, about flu cases also, because there's going to be increased testing, um, I assume, over this um, fall and winter of healthcare providers as they become symptomatic. Um, you know, we, that may be something coming, you know, when we start looking at cases um, later in the season of healthcare providers who might be high risk, um, because they're going to, you know, be swabbing them for both. Um, so that, 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 that may be something to come. And um, in terms of the safety, I'm actually not sure, and I can, I can take a look at this afterwards and perhaps you can provide it. I'm not sure if that's possible, you know, in some of the resources after the webinar, but um, getting a second flu vaccine should be safe. So we know for young children who typically would receive the split dose vaccine, like a half dose vaccine, that they can get the full dose vaccine safely. So um, that's kind of a, a newer recommendation. And so I'm obviously extrapolating that to an adult patient who's receiving two adult doses, and I couldn't tell you with certainty, um, but there is some safety data in, in certain age ranges where getting that second flu vaccine is completely safe. Thank you. So, Corinne, what has been your experience um, in the biggest struggle in getting patients vaccinated in your area or the areas that you have worked in? I think a lot of it's fear. You know, like patients are developing this agoraphobia now. They just, they don't want to leave their house. You know, they didn't want to stay home, but now they don't want to leave. <laughs> and so um, convincing them to come out and it's okay. And this is what we're doing for them. Once they hear what we've done um, to keep them safe and, and what the hospital system's done to keep them safe, a lot of them do feel a little bit better about it. Um, but, and then, you know, they, they hear stuff, you know, about COVID and flu. And unfortunately, again, it's not backed by any hard science and, and reassuring them that, that there's a difference between rumor and science and um, hoping that they, they understand that piece of it. Um, I, I'd say that the fear, peace, and education is probably the biggest barrier for, for my population. So Dr. Briney, you mentioned that persons with COVID-19 could delay their flu vaccine. Could you please restate the reasons behind that? So the main reason for delaying the flu vaccine is really just to protect others. So not for the person who has COVID-19, it's completely safe for them to receive that vaccination, even if they have an active case of COVID-19. Um, and certainly if, if they're already in your clinic or in your hospital, um, that's an ideal time to vaccinate them. Um, you're already in contact with them anyways, but probably it's not the best time to bring them in specifically for their vaccine, especially if you're going to have them waiting in, you know, in a line outdoors, even if faced or in your waiting room. And, um, you know, people are still being cautious about conserving PPE. So it might be better just to wait until they have met all the requirements to, re um, to stop isolation. Thank you. And then Corinne, are you noticing differences in patients? accepting the flu vaccine um, this year since COVID has hit? Yeah, I, I have to say that um, they they seem to be a little more for it, um, especially when they, um, I, I guess I have less arguing that I've been doing so far this season. I wouldn't say arguing, but persuasive discussion with patients, um, you know, because they're, they're very fearful of COVID and they worry, you know, that this increases their risk of, of complications and you know, mortality and all of that. And so um, it seems that patients are a little more willing to get it. In fact, um, my office is um, kind of ahead of schedule of vaccination for patients. Um, our volume of vaccine that we normally um, order usually will last us um, through December. And this year, it looks like we ordered the same amount. We're probably going to be out um, mid-November. So you know, I, I think that's, at least in my personal practice, that speaks to patients um, being more willing to, to get vaccinated at the time of visit. Absolutely. That's, that's good news. So, Dr. Briney, what are the specific contraindications for flu vaccine in persons who have a GBS or Guillain-Barre syndrome? Um, if somebody's had Guillain-Barre syndrome before, the, one of the most important things to know is which vaccine caused it. So if they specifically had Guillain-Barre, maybe not cause, we can't always know necessarily cause, but I would say, you know, after the flu vaccine and specifically after the flu vaccine within six weeks of the flu vaccine, then that is probably a 
medication. You want to weigh that though with the benefits of that patient too. So if that person has severe chronic illness that puts them at higher risk of having flu related complications, um, then you just kind of have to compare those, you know, risks and benefits. But the, the main contraindication just to kind of like make it easier would be having Yon barre um, after the flu vaccine with six flu vaccine administration. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions coming through the um, chat box from our attendees. So um, at this time, what I will do is we'll go ahead and close out the webinar. I would like to thank both of you for excellent presentations on the on the flu vaccine and trying to get our patients to um, accept coming in and uh, um, getting the vaccination. And, and especially, again, with this COVID pandemic that, that people are taking the step forward to get vaccinated. We've provided the references here also for um, the attendees to have access to those references. And um, other than that, we would like to thank everyone for attending and uh, otherwise have a great afternoon. Thanks y'all.